Welcome back to Have You Swallowed the Hook, a 21st century challenge to a 19th century worldview of evolution. My name is Thomas Bentley, and as we get started in episode number two, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we go into looking at the two models, the two ways that the, the popular way today and the biblical way of origins, of creation, I pray that whoever's watching here today will come away with a new understanding, one that draws him closer to you and understands who you are as our Creator and our Savior. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, in the second episode, we're going to look at this hook that's swimming through the cultures of our society since 1987 and that's snagging as many people as it can. And this is worldview or this idea that only evolution fits the data. I want to talk about that for a minute. You know, there's a big difference between data and the interpretation of that data. Let me give you an example of what I mean by a story that I, I read from Dr. Ariel Roth. It's a really interesting story of a scientist that I guess he must have known, a very proud scientist, who uh, wanted to show off to his friends his skill. And one of his skills was that he would train fleas to jump when he gave them a verbal command. So he would get his friends together and, and he would say, let me show you how good I am at this. He would place the flea down. Of course, they were all had magnifying glasses looking at the flea. And he would give the verbal command and the flea would jump. And then he would pick the flea up and he would pull off one of its legs and put it back down. And they would look and he would give the verbal command and it would try to jump. And he would do this again and again until finally he got down to the last leg. He, so he takes the last leg off the flea, places it down there, and everyone's just sort of looking around with their magnifying glasses, wondering what's coming next. And he gives the verbal command. And the flea doesn't move. And they're all looking at one another like, I think we should probably leave. But he says to them, you know, I have done this experiment so many times, I have learned that when you pull off all the legs from a flea, it can no longer hear. Now, that's one interpretation of the data, isn't it? You pull off all the legs of a flea, it can no longer hear. And another one might be, well, if you pull off all the legs of a flea, it can't jump because it doesn't have any legs. But imagine for a moment, this idea of data and interpretation. Imagine for a moment that all the science textbooks only allowed one interpretation of the data. They only allowed the interpretation that when you pull off all the, all the legs from a flea, it cannot jump because it cannot hear. It'd be a crazy world, wouldn't it? But friends, that's exactly what's happening today. They will only allow one interpretation of the data that we see all around us. You see, the data that we're talking about is, is the world in which we live. It's all the life in that world. It's the fossil record that tells us what happened in the distant past. And what would happen if in all the science textbooks and everywhere you went, there was only one interpretation allowed of the data? See, this is why they say only evolution fits the data. They're cooking the books because they're only allowing you one interpretation. Since 1987, only the atheistic interpretation of, or of origins is allowed, and that's the origin worldview story of evolution. You know, I didn't think that was very fair. So what I thought we would do in this episode is that we would take a look at the two interpretations of the data. We'll take a look at the creation story, and we'll take a look at the evolution story. We'll look at both of these models, and we'll see, we'll ask the question at the end, which one makes the most sense to you? Okay, well let's get started. And I'm going to start with the creation model. That's my favorite. And in the creation model, if I was going to use one word to describe it, I would use the word taxonomy. And taxonomy, of course, is a classification of different life into their various kinds. 
And that's exactly what the creation model says. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. It says, So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the water swam, according to their kinds, and every winged bird, according to its kinds. You see the taxonomy there? And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And so we see in the creation model that, oh, for, for example, even in uh, the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 39, there's no difference. It says, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another of beasts and another of flesh of birds and another of fish. In other words, the creation model talks about taxonomy. Taxonomy where a creator God, a designer, originally created the first prototypes of all the life that we have here, fully formed in the adult state, capable of reproducing. And then those kinds of life reproduced and, be, and basically stayed the same kinds of life. Now, the creation model, as you see here, if, if the bottom axis is the kinds of life, the, as you're going up the y-axis, that's time. And in the creation model, the kinds of life over time stay the same kinds of life. Now, they, they may adapt, but they stay the same kinds over time. So we should see in the distant past the same kinds of life that we have today. That's the creation model. But interestingly, the creation model is also the one that can answer the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Obviously, uh, the evolution model has no voice in this, but the creation model says that they were originally created as prototypes, fully adult and capable of reproducing. So the chicken came first, that's the answer, okay? Uh, also, the creation model is the only model out there that can actually explain why we have client organisms, organisms like plants that require insects to pollinate them. This is only explained by a design that it was already intentioned. It, the evolutionists have no explanation because theirs is chaotic and it doesn't require anything. So, here's what I want to do. I want to ask the question, where could we go to find out if the creation model actually is a better interpretation of the data. And the answer to that is we need to go look at fossils. Uh, this picture that you see up here is a picture of my son. Uh, not long ago we got a chance to go to the Black Hills in South Dakota and there in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota, you find the University of Mines. And they have a really cool fossil museum. And uh, we got to go and look at it. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through the museum and look at some pictures that I took and, and here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to do this. Ask yourself this question. Are the fossils that I'm showing you that represent the distant past, do the kinds of life that I'm showing you, are they the same kinds of life that we have today? In other words, are uh, fish still fish? Are birds still birds? Are insects still insects? You know, are the kinds of animals we have, are they the same? Or are they just drastically different? Let's take a look. Uh, First, though, before we start, I'm going to talk about how fossils are formed. Uh, there's a, a creation of li a facts of life, uh, creation eye blog spot that writes, Dr. Gary Parker, he writes, most fossils are formed when a plant or animal is quickly buried and deeply buried out of reach of scavengers and currents, usually in mud, lime, or sand sediment, rich in cementing materials that harden and preserve at least part of the dead creature. Evolutionists and creationists agree. Now, th this is a new thing. Evolutionists are coming around here to, to the creation worldview here. The ideal conditions for forming most fossils and fossil-bearing rock layers are flood conditions. And of course, we know that the Bible talks about a, a flood that caused a lot of that happening. Interesting, the evolutionists are coming around. So as we walk through the, this museum, first thing I saw was a perch. By the way, this fossil perch is the same kind as you see in the picture there, the modern equivalent. And then we walked by and I saw a bat and it had to take a picture. And, and right next to this bat fossil, I put the modern skeleton of a bat. Don't they look the same to you? They're remarkably very much the same animal today, isn't it? Uh, and this one I really love. This one here is talking about the deep diver, the submarine of the sea, if you will, the chambered nautilus. In the background there, I found this case filled with chambered nautiluses. And, of, and uh, of course, the one in the foreground is the same one we have today. There's no change. Same one that we have today. I, I saw a, a horse, uh, the, uh, the uh, fossil of, of a horse. And interestingly, the, the one on the, on the 
left side over there is an actual Arabian skeleton head, and the one on the right is the fossil. Uh, do they look the same to you? They certainly look the same to me. I don't see much difference there. Uh, this one particular fish here is from the Spardae family in Italy. And here we see the exact fish we have today. This fossil is another fish, again, still a fish. Uh, now when you come to insects, it's really interesting to see all the different kinds of life that are out there that are insects. For example, in this, in this picture right here, we have a wolf spider, the same kind we have today. Uh, do you recognize the bee? Looks like one we have today, doesn't it? And, and that one over there is a wasp. And then this one over here in the corner is a cockroach. Kind of wish we didn't have those, right? But these are all the same kind of insects from the distant past that we have today. Same kind of life. Uh, how about plants? Well, here's a sassafras plant, and here's the uh, equivalent today. Here is a maple leaf. And this is a giant maple here, and there's the equivalent. Here's a fern, and this is just a part of a fern. If you look at the leaf, it's amazing how similar they are. Just, just compare the, the modern fern to the fern in that fossil, and it's like, whoa, we're talking the same thing here. This one was really fascinating to me. This one is a shark vertebrae, which they say is extremely rare because shark vertebrates are made of, of cartilage. They're not made of bone. And so this, this, must have been, this shark must have been buried very rapidly and, and sedimentized quickly. Uh, here is a hatchet fish, and here's the today's hatchet fish today. They're the exact same fish. Interestingly, the hatchet fish is a very, found in very deep waters, which means that that must have been some flood that brought it all the way up into Poland and buried it there. That's where it was found. And think about eggs. We found fossilized eggs, and these eggs, friends, they look just like the eggs we have today. Look, here's another. This is one right from the exhibit. Do, you, do those, those eggs look like the eggs that you see every day when, you, uh, when you're looking at birds' eggs? Same ones, no different. Uh, here's an alligator, the same kind of alligator that we have today. Here is a turtle. This is a sea turtle, and that's the skull, the head of the skull that I found. This is a same kind of animal that we have today, same kind of life that exists today. Here's a hound shark. It looks like it's swimming, doesn't it, as it's caught in, in the uh, rock. Must have been very rapid how it was buried. Here's a gar, and I've been to uh, these, these places where you can walk in and see fish all around you, and I've seen gar. And there it is. There's the fossil, and there's the same one. Here is a glass sponge. They used to say that glass sponges were extinct for millions and millions of years. They were extinct, but then they found them. Still alive. There's the living one, and there's the fossil. Fascinating. And so what, what we find is that the fossil record indicates that we have the exact same kinds of life in the distant past as we have today. So which model is, is it actually describes the data better? I would say it's the creation model. And I want to talk to you for a minute about adaptability, which I said was part of the creation model. If you look at, the, for example, dogs, you'll see an immense amount of adaptability. But now, are these dogs like different species? Are they like, you know, evolved somehow? Or are they from the same stock? Let's find out. Geneticist Hans Elgren writes this in Genomics. It was in a magazine called Nature in 2005. He says, all dogs from the smallest chihuahua to the biggest Great Dane emerge from the same basic set of genes. At the DNA level, two randomly chosen dogs differ by only about as much as two randomly chosen people do. Yet the variation in appearance and size and behavior in dogs is just mind-boggling. So you see, genetically, they're the same, but they have the ability to adapt. And the adaption is incredible, isn't it? We have so many friends. Uh, Dr. Warren Johns writes in the Genesis file, according to the Westminster Kennel Club, an estimated 400 species of dogs claim descent from common canine ancestry. Courtesy of selective gene mixing, collies and poodles look different, but continue as dogs, man's favorite animal companion. And see, this is the way it is. You know, the creation model says they were created after their kinds. Over time, they remain the same kinds, but they have the ability to adapt. Think about the human population for a moment. The Bible talks about in Genesis that at one time, the prototype human population and, and their, their children uh, grew to the place where they all had one language and they were all living in one place. And God, it says in Genesis, did what essentially would be selective breeding. God changed or confused the languages of this population. 
And the people then separated from one another based upon language. And they went into their own groups all across the, the world. And there, in their own languages, they interbred. And they lived in their environment. And this is why we have the adaptation that we see here. All the different races of people. The creation model tells you, friend, that you, none of you, are less evolved than somebody else. All of us came from that same first two prototypes of humans that God had created. So we're all related. So you should remember that. The creation model tells us that. And the reason that we have this, this distant past life always staying the same kind, even though they can adapt, is this word stasis. Let me explain what I mean. The University of Michigan did a study and it was a 20-year study where they would try to take E. coli and, and stress it in environments that would cause it to adapt. And after 20 years, and after seeing 40,000 adaptations in E. coli, guess what? They would always reproduce another E. coli. And the reason that they would always produce another E. coli is because of the science of genetics. You know, in the science of genetics, you have classical genetics, which deals with traits and her heredity, but then you have molecular Genetics, which talks about this exquisite information containing DNA. The DNA that contains the information that it takes to build that life. And it's because of that DNA that life does not change over time. It can adapt, but it doesn't change. Dr. Nancy Darrell writes in Six Days Why 50 Scientists Choose to Believe in Creation. She's a botanist. She says this about the, the DNA itself. She says, the DNA double helix is analogous to the paper and ink of my biology textbooks. Anyone who has sat down in front of a blank piece of paper in an examination will be aware of the need of something more than paper, ink, in order to pass. We need ideas. We need concepts. We need mathematical equations. In other words, we need information. And that's exactly what's contained in DNA. DNA is not just a bunch of randomly uh, strewn chemicals. It is actually information rich. And from this DNA then, we have little micro machines that read it and make proteins that make you. And so DNA then is the library of instructions that make a person or make any creature. DNA is the blueprint, if you will, of that life. And I want to talk about that for a minute because think about this house for a minute. Most of us understand that, that a house blueprint can build, a builder can go and take the blueprint and he can build that house. In fact, he can build many houses that look like it. They may have different color on the outside, they may have different shutters, but they're all the same house because they're built on the same blueprint, just like there are many different people with different colors on the outside and different appearances. They're all still the same because they're built on the same blueprint. Now, I could have another house it's still in the family of houses, but it's on a different blueprint, and so it's totally different looking. And the same thing is true in the real world, where we could have a bird like this pelican or this owl, to totally different looking. They're built on, even though they're the same family, they're built on different blueprints, and so they have different structures in them. Now imagine something for a minute. Let's just pretend that this is my house, and I'm not really happy with the way it looks, and so I want to change this house. I want it to adapt to something. I want it to morph to another house. I, I, what would I do? Well, in the real world, what I would do is I would call a contractor and the contractor would say, let me look at the blueprint. He would take my existing blueprint and then he would, with his mind and his ability to see forward, he would add information to that blueprint to make my house that looks like this go to a house that looks like this. Now obviously, we would never think that that uh, contractor would take the blueprints, put it in a shredder, and shred it all up randomly. You would never get anything out of a house like that, would you? So in order, here's my point, in order for you to go from one blueprint to another blueprint, you have to add information. You, it can't happen any other way. You actually have to add information to the blueprint to make it go from one thing to another thing, okay? As long as we got that. For example, like the evolutionists, they tell us that reptiles evolved into birds. So in order for us to go from a reptile with its blueprint, its DNA pattern, to a bird with a totally different one, with different structures and different mechanisms, you have to add information to that genetic code to make it go from one to the other. There's no other way for it to work. You have to add information. And this, my friends, as we move into the evolutionist model, is exactly the bold claim that evolutionists make. They claim 
that three random processes can cause one kind of life to morph into another kind of life. And these three processes are random mutation, natural selection, and time. So I think we ought to spend a few moments to check those out for a minute. Let's look with natural selection. Let's start with that one. There's a, a, a professor, Dr. Carl Whelan. He writes an excellent article on how we can understand natural selection and how it's being misunderstood today. He writes, natural selection is really a very straightforward, common sense insight. A creationist, the chemist zoologist Edward Blythe, in 1810, 1873, wrote about it in 1835 to seven before Darwin, who very likely borrowed the idea from Blythe. Now he goes on and says this, an organism may possess some inheritable trait or character which in a given environment gives that organism a greater chance of passing on all of its genes to the next generation compared to those of its fellows which don't have it. Over succeeding generations, that trait or character has a good chance of becoming more widespread in the population. And so what he does is he gives us an illustration to help us think about it. He imagines a population, let's say on an island, of trees. And in this population of the same kind of tree, there's genetic material, genetic information, that allows that population to produce trees that have long roots, short roots, and medium roots. And everything's okay in that population as long as there's plenty of moisture, the, the, the population will continue, all the trees will drop their seeds and the seeds will continue propagating and you'll have in that population long roots, medium roots, and short roots. But something terrible happens, there's a drought. And the drought lasts for a long time. And so in that drought, all the trees that have short roots that can't reach the deeper water die. The trees with the medium roots struggle and eventually die. And so what you have left then is you have a population of trees with long roots that are continually populating the, with their seeds and growing and growing. And eventually you end up with an area that has trees that have adapted to the deeper water. But here's the important, I hope that you caught this when you saw this. The original population had a lot of genetic information. You could make long roots, short roots, and medium roots. That's all genetic information. But the new generation that came after it with natural selection has eliminated some of that information. And this is what Dr. Whelan wants us to understand. This is so important for you to understand. He says, it cannot be stressed enough that what natural selection actually does is get rid of information. It is not capable of creating anything new by definition. And so what he's saying is, is that natural selection cannot create new information to make one kind of life, the blueprint of that life, to morph over to another kind of life because guess what? It's not how it works. It eliminates information. It doesn't create information. Let me give you an example of this. Let's imagine the first horses, the first prototype horses that ran on the plain. You know, we have taken those horses and we have... Uh, selectively bred them to the point that we have great big workhorses and tiny, tiny little ponies. Have you ever seen one of those? They're incredibly small. Guess what? Once you have done that, you can never go the other way. You can never go from the tiny pony back to the original because all that genetic information that you did to selectively get there is gone. You have eliminated information through selection, basically. It wasn't natural. You did it. So the question you got to ask yourself is, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If, if this was the case, why natural selection? Why is natural selection always held up somewhere as this big magical power to make life morph from one kind to the other? Well, doctors H. Morris and Dr. G. Parker answer that in the book called What is Creation Science? They write, if natural selection is such a profound idea and Blythe published it before Darwin, then why isn't Blythe's name a household word? Perhaps because he was a creationist. Hmm. It was not principally the scientific application of natural selection that attracted attention in 1859. It was the presumed philosophic and religious implications 
Okay, you catching this? Evolutionists were not content to treat natural selection as simply an observable ecological process. They, T.H. Huxley and Herbert Spencer, much more than Darwin, here's the big atheists of that era, insisted on making natural selection the touchstone of a new philosophy, a religion without revelation. Atheism, as Julian Huxley later called it. For them, as for many others, the real significance of the Darwinian revolution was religious and philosophic, not scientific. Evolu the early evolutionists were basically anti-creationists who wanted to explain design without creation. And so they co-opt this idea of natural selection, which we now know today cannot add information to make one kind of life morph into another kind of life. And so what's happened in our world today is essentially what scientists are doing when they say natural selection is the reason that, you morph, you, that evolution happened, is they are ascribing to nature a power that it does not possess. They're ascribing to nature the ability to, to think ahead like a designer, like a contractor, and move from one kind of life to another. And when they do that, they turn you into pagans. The essence of all pagan religion is nature worship. And now they want you to worship nature as if it had power to design. Think about that for a moment. Let's go to random mutations. First, let's talk about what a random mutation is. And don't ask me. Let's go and ask microbiologist Dr. Michael Behe. What is a random mutation? He writes in Darwin's Black Box, a mutation is a change in one of the lines of instruction. So we're talking DNA now. So instead of saying, take a quarter inch nut, a mutation might say, take a three eighths inch nut. What a mutation cannot do is to change all the instructions in one step to say, build a fax machine instead of a radio. And so a mutation then is actually an error so you're going, the reader's going along, it's looking, and it finds an error. Uh, Dr. Nancy Durrell follows that. She says, genetic mutation, now this is an interesting point, genetic mutation never causes an increase in information. And in most cases, information is lost. Think about sickle cell disease. That's a disease where a mutation has happened, and now that last loss, last loss of information, you see the, the normal, round-looking blood cell becomes like a, uh, pie-shaped sickle. So this is important to understand. Let's think about it this way. All of us have seen a DVD. Many of us have had DVD players. We put a movie in the DVD or something that we're watching. And the information on that DVD is, is encoded in ones and zeros by little impressions on it. And the reader comes along looking for that information. It's expecting to find it. And as it's coming along looking for that information, a, let's say that there's a random mutation that happens. What do we call those? We call them a scratch. A scratch occurs on the disk. So the reader comes along, it's looking for that information that it's, it's designed to look for. All of a sudden it gets to the scratch. Uh, there's a quarter inch nut instead of a three eighths inch nut. In other words, it's looking for something, it doesn't find it. What do you see? You don't see something new. What you see is you see pixelation. And if it's bad enough, you see loss of function. And that's essentially what a mutation does. It's how it works. And believing that random mutations can cause one kind of life to morph into another kind of life is sort of like believing that a scratch on a DVD will change the scene in a movie. Or that if you get enough scratches on a DVD and you apply natural selection to it, it'll actually change the whole plot. And if you could believe that, then maybe you could believe in uh, evolution today. Listen to what Dr. Nancy Darrell writes again in six days. She says, when a bacterium becomes resistant to streptomycin, a mutation has occurred in the DNA so that streptomycin can no longer lock on to the site of protein manufacture and interfere with the process. The change could occur in a number of places in the gene, but what will always have the same effect. What has actually happened to the bacterium is that there has been a loss of information in the genes. Now did you catch that? You see, evolution requires, because we understand genetics today, requires that new information be created to go from one kind of life to the other. But we just found out that random mutation cannot do that. Random mutations do not have that ability. So let's kind of review what we've learned here. Natural selection 
cannot add information to cause one kind of life to mutate into another. Random mutations cannot add any new information to cause one kind of life to mutate into the other. And so the, the problem for evolutionists is, is tremendous because when you think about the, the complexity of life, for example, the most simple cell uh, life that we have, they tell me, has millions of lines of code in it, DNA, instructions. And sophisticated life forms like yourself have trillions of lines. And so what this means is that in order for this simple cell to morph itself into all kinds of life, which is the spontaneous generation myth, uh, faith-based belief, that means that you have to go from millions of lines of codes to trillions of lines of codes, which means you, to, you must absolutely add new information to make this kind of life morph into that kind of life. But we've just learned that that's impossible. It just cannot happen. So, let's look at Dr. Lee Spencer as we close this out. He writes in a book, Not by Chance, Shattering the Modern Theory of Evolution. Notice he's got modern theory of evolution on there. He says, the failure to observe even one mutation that adds information is more than a failure to find support for the theory. It is evidence against the theory. So, what's the evolutionist to do? Well, now we have come to the powerhouse of evolution. We have come to the big gun of evolution, and that is the word time. Let's think about it, friends. Imagine I'm standing up here today and I happen to have an orange with me. And I know you out there in the audience are probably looking at my imaginary orange here and saying, what are you gonna talk about now? Well, imagine that I told you that this orange, I'm going to set it here and in 50 years, it will turn into a frog. I imagine you would look at me like, oh yeah, right. He's not firing on all his cylinders today. But let me kick it up a notch. Imagine I said to you, you see this orange here? In a million years, it will turn into a frog. Oh, wait, a million years? Well, I, I guess in a million years, anything's possible. Well, I suppose in a million years that orange could turn into a, a frog, couldn't it? Well, I'll kick it up a little more. How about a billion years? Oh, a billion years. Oh, surely, yeah, yeah, a billion years. Yeah, anything could happen in a billion years. And this is exactly how it works. I want to show you something. Uh, this man right here, his name is George Wald. He was a, given a Nobel Prize in, in uh, physiology for his views on the origin of life. And I want you to listen to what he says about time. Time is the hero of the plot. The time with which we have to deal is of the order of two billion years. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible, the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. You see, friends, they know that natural selection can't cause one kind of life to morph into another kind of life. They know random mutations can't do it. So now they go for the big gun, and that's the science of your imagination. You see, this is, the, this is really where the science of evolution happens. It's in the science of imagination, because if I can get you to believe that it happened, then for you it did happen. I can get you to turn your eyes from the Creator God who made you over to the calf idols of evolution simply by putting it in your mind that it happened. And I don't need any data to do that. I just use your imagination. Let me give you an example how this works historically. And this is just sort of a template for how all of it works. Back in the 1970s, there was a guy named Dr. John Alstron, and he's from Yale University. He was considered to be the expert on bird evolution. And he had this idea. He said, you know, reptiles evolved into birds, and the way they did it was they had, they had a need to catch bugs, and so they had an adaptation. They, they grew feathers on their forelimbs to make it more advantageous for them to catch bugs. It was called the bird net idea. And this became popularized. In fact, the British Museum built a model that looked like this, put it in the museum to show people how evolution of birds worked. But by the time we get to the 1980s, Scientists were saying, you know, this idea is not very scientific. And Dr. Olbstrom was interviewed about that in Science Magazine, 1983 interview. And this is written in a book called uh, 
Darwin's Enigma by Luther Sutherland, great book to get. In the interview, they asked him, they says, okay, so what about the bird net idea? Is it dead now? And he says, yes, says Obstrom, the insect net idea is dead. It did its job. What was its job? Its job was to get you to believe and imagine that evolution could actually happen. That's what its job was. As insidious as that sounds, that's where the science of evolution really is going right now. I mean, think about this, the icon of evolution that we have here in this room and on this screen. The, the icon of, of apes morphing into humans. Now, if you look at this picture carefully, I'm gonna share with you what you'll always find in these pictures. You ready? In the beginning, the two little monkeys back there, those are the same kind of monkeys we have today, aren't they? And, and the guy at the end here kind of looks like the kind of guy we have today. But everything in the middle is simply the imagination of an artist. There's no data. So we go from real monkeys to a human, and everything in between is for your imagination. And I think if you can believe that that's true, then why couldn't you believe that this is true? That people, the overweight people, will just uh, turn into pigs. I mean, an artist could draw it, so why won't you believe it? If I can just get you to imagine that, you know? Perhaps there'd be less overeating who knows? But the point that I'm trying to make here is that, is that this is the science of evolution, your imagination, to get you to believe that it happened. And if they do, then they can get you to turn from your creator God to the calf idols of evolution. And one of the ways they do that is through missing links. And I'm going to just run through some real quick here with you. The first of the missing links is probably the most insidious because it happened at a time in the 19th century when common sense Baconian science was saying, hey Darwin, you Darwinian people, there's no data, there's no proof, this don't make no sense, this is wrong. And right in the midst of that battle, some people came together and they took a piece of a human skull and they took an ape-like jaw, stuck them together, and claimed that it was a half a million year old missing link. It was called the Pit Dow Man. Almost immediately, the media jumped on the bandwagon and says, New York Times runs this article, ran the article, Darwin's theory is proved true, and it begins to be featured in textbooks and all this stuff. And suddenly, the Baconian scientists were being squished down by the other people. Right at the time when, the, when we needed to have good science, suddenly people were starting to accept evolution because of the pit down man. Well, guess what? It took, it took decades later. And what had happened was these, these guys that made the fake, they said, well, we don't want any creationists to destroy our discovery. So they never showed anybody the real pieces. They just made molds. And they, everybody examined the molds. Finally, decades later, they got to look at the original pieces and they said, whoa, this is a human skull and this is an ape jaw. But you know, want to know something? For those decades, it did its job. It did its job. Nebraska man, 1922, right at the midst of the time of the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee, and right there in the midst of that trial, they brought up this fossil evidence. It was a tooth. And here's what they said. They used this fossil evidence to claim that it was a million-year-old missing link. And here's a picture that they drew of it. You know, all these imaginative pictures, lots of fun. But what was it? The truth of the matter? Later on, they found out, you know, this is just an extinct pig's tooth. But for another generation, it did its job. You go to Java Man. This is an interesting story. A guy named Eugene Du Bois was a guy that found this thing. It says, uh, and, and interestingly enough, 1981, Harvard professor Richard Lowenton declared that Java Man should be taught as one of the five facts of evolution. But what was left out? What Du Bois failed to report at the time was the fact that he found a complete human skull near the same skull cap, and today this man dismisses his own find as unrelated parts of a giant gibbon and a human. Interestingly, but for another generation, it did its job. Uh, then you come into the 1970s with the Austropithecines, the, this Lucy. There were two families, the Lakey family and Johansson, and they were going into Africa and they were looking at fossils of basically a remains of apes, and they were all apes, but one of them 
had a partial hip bone. And so what did they do? They found it, and this is what they imagined. Whoa, this is the one that walked upright. This is the missing link. Whoa, we've been waiting for this guy. And of course, listen to what uh, Professor Charles Oxnard reports. He says, the, the, this fossil provides a warning against too readily acceptance of this view. If the Australopithecines walked upright, it was not in the human manner. Be critical. We must encourage our science students to examine evidence more critically. And I might add, that's what the two model creation evolution concept is all about. Amen. You know, we need to have the two models out there. And the, they, they didn't report also that there was human remains underneath Lucy and there were tools. So obviously there was a lot of monkey business going on with these fossil fakes. But for another generation, they did their job. Here's another one. The, the, these uh, colents fish have a, a, a lobe on them that has a little bony structure. And evolutionists have always you know, dreamed that this was the fish that walked out of the ocean and started walking on land. You know, this was the guy that with his little bony fins started walking out and he started evolving into something else. Well, they kept telling us that these fish were extinct. But guess what? In 1938, they found living ones. But here's where the deception gets really insidious. A leading textbook manufacturer for our children put this coal length in 1998 after the government decided that only evolution can be taught this textbook manufacturer put this colon in there as evidence of a creature that evolved. It's insidious, but this is what's happening in our world today when we're living with imagination rather than real science. And probably the last one of these I want to share with you is, is the Archaeoraptor. And this one, my friends, could make a great movie. You could picture the scenes over in China uh, where everything else is made, suddenly uh, a fossil is out and smuggled out of the country, and it makes its way over to the Tucson Fox Fossil Auction, very famous auction. And there, a man who owned a museum named Circus sees it, and he says, whoa, wait, this thing looks like a, a bird a, a, and a reptile. Wait a minute, this is the missing link we've been waiting for. This is the one. Birds to reptiles, you know. And so he buys this thing for almost $80,000. First thing he does is he contacts some helpers and he contacts the National Geographic Society. Oh, and they're so happy about that. Immediately, without even you know, having this thing studied, they prepare an issue that, that was in National Geographic in November 1999. If you can find it, it's there. And they claimed, new bird-like fossil, missing link in evolution. Oh, yes, it's true. And of course, this in the movie now, this is the time when the, 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 the child, the young person who's been going to, to school at the church and learning about God, takes his Bible and shuts it and sadly puts it down and says, evolution is true. Right? Isn't that about the time in the story that happens? But fortunately, this one didn't last for decades. Because what happened was, there, there, a guy in, in China, he's a paleontologist named Zhu Xing, he says, um, did that come from China? Yes. I'd like to examine it, please. And he examines this thing and he says, this is a uh, fossil fake. This, uh, there's a lot of that stuff going on in my country because they, you know, they know that you want this stuff, so they're making them. And uh, this is a fake. And so it comes out in the news. This was uh, in Science and Ideas, and it was written in a magazine. It says, the pit Dow chicken. You know, it, it was scientists eat crow over so-called missing link. And here's Zoo's caution. He says, you do get a lot of fakes. It's a huge black market. But you know what? They do their jobs, don't they? The Museum of Natural History wrote about this. He says, in Science News in 2001, it says, they want to see feathers, so they see feathers. This is simply an exercise in wishful thinking. But scientists have to have their origin story, and so they're willing to do anything to keep it in your imagination. And in every one of these cases, friends, the bottom line is they did their job. For another generation, people were snowed by the theory of evolution, not by the data, but by the imagination of science. And, you know, I want to tell you that as a young person, I really used to like to, to see magic tricks. You, you ever like magic tricks? 
Sure, a magic trick is neat because it's, an, it's like an illusion. They show you something and you think it's real, but it's not really real. And you know, evolution is just filled with magic tricks. I'll give you an example of some magic tricks. And what they do is, remember I told you these, these hooks that are swimming in our culture, they don't have any bait on them because there's no data. They're just swimming in the culture hoping to snag you into becoming an atheist or a secular humanist because there's no data there. And so here's how they do it. One of the examples is the evolutionist tree of life. Has anyone here ever seen the evolutionist tree of life? One of the interesting things about it is if you were to look at where all these little intersections occur in the evolutionist tree of life, you'll notice that there is no data there. There's nothing there. And you go out to the ends of the trees and you find things that are living today. So if you were to take one of these trees and basically eliminate the structure of the tree and just look at what's left, what do you find? You find things that are already existing today. This is an illusion that creates data where there is no data. But the thing I want to ask here is this. If the fossil record is true and evolution is true, what should we find in the fossil record to prove that evolution was true? In other words, if their model is that things morphed, what should we find in the fossil record to prove that things morphed? We, you know, we'll look at the data and see whether their model matches the data. What do you think there would be? Well, of course, what we're going to hope to find there if we're evolutionists is tweens. Something between this, something between that. Something between an ape and a man, something between a whatever and an insect, something between a thisy and a thatty, right? You want to find those things. And uh, there was a, a doctor, his name was Dr. James S. Allen. He writes in, in six days, he says, that biologists in the field of population and quantitative genetics, that's what he does. And he looked at studies into the number of intermediate tweens, between this is and that is, that you would have to have to go between an ape and a man. Now remember, this guy is a scientist in, in quantitative genetics. So he's looking at how the information would have to change to go from here to there. And here's what he came up with. He said that you would have to have 150 billion unique body types to go from an ape to a man. Now, you realize that you can't just have one of these. You have to have a population of them. And so if you imagine a, a population of even 100,000, multiply 100,000 times 150 billion, and that's how many we're talking about. But wait, you can't stop there. You have to think about every single form of life, all the plants that we have on our planet, all the types of life, and you have to have all the intermediates and all the tweens that existed for those. What are we talking about, friends? We're talking about innumerable numbers, uncountable numbers of intermediates. And so when they show you this evolution model, it's very narrow looking, quite uh, pretty. Really, the, the reality is it's got to be huge because they have to find zillions and zillions of these intermediate body types. And this is exactly what Darwin knew. Charles Darwin himself talked about this in Life and Letters of Charles Darwin. He said, if my theory be true, Numberless intermediate varieties. Now, did you catch the word he used? What's the main word there? Numberless. Hmm, he, he did get that right. Numberless intermediate varieties linking closely together all the species of the same group must have assuredly existed. Okay, so there we go. But guess what else Charles Darwin said? He said, well, why is it that every geological formation and every stratum why aren't they full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any finely graduated organic chain. And this is the most obvious and serious objection that can be urged against the theory. Hello? In other words, his model of origins doesn't match the data. You'd think that people would get smart enough to throw it away. Dr. David Ropp. Now let's go into the era of the 1980s as we come to the era of the 1980s and meet this guy. His name is Dr. David Ropp. He's the uh, curator of the famous Field Museum in the Natural History in Chicago and they have lots of fossils there. And he was, in 1979, he wrote this or said this. He said, well, here we are now, about 120 years after Darwin. And knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. Ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition than we had in Darwin's time, which they didn't have any in Darwin's time. 
He goes on to say this. He says, by this I mean that some of the classical cases of Darwinian change in the fossil record, such as the evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. In other words, these horses are the same kind of horses. We do see change, all right. It's simply variation within type, the kind of change that creationists expected all along. Isn't that interesting? Dr. David Kitts of the University of Oklahoma writes in uh, the magazine Evolution. He says, despite the bright promise that paleontology provides a means of seeing evolution, it has presented some nasty difficulties for evolutionists, the most notorious of which is the presence of gaps. You know, the fossil record, in order for their model to be true, they have to find all these intermediates. Friends, if their model was true, there would be so many intermediates out there that you would be going to your local hardware store and you would be buying them for decorative rocks in your house. There would just be that many, but there are none. There's none. He says, evolution requires intermediate forms between species and paleontology does not provide them. Which model, uh, let me ask you a question, friends. Which of these two models actually matches the data? Remember, I told you the reason they say only evolution matches the data is because they only allow you one interpretation. But as I've shown you these two models, I want to ask you the question, which one makes the most sense to you? Which one of these models actually accurately describes what we see in the data, the life around us, the fossil record which shows us the distant past? Well, friends, I'm going to share with you, it's not the evolution model, it's the creation model. Can you say amen to that? But I want to close with just thinking, go one more step here, uh, talking about these two models. And I want to talk specifically about you right now. Did you know that in the evolutionist model, you're just basically an accident, accident in the skid marks of time? Think about this. Evolutionist George Gaylord wrote this in The Meaning of Evolution. In other words, what does evolution mean to you as a human? He said, man is the result of a purposeless a natural process that did not have him in mind. See, in the evolutionist worldview, you, my friend, are an accident. You're a meaningless nothing. You're equivalent to the, a mouse. Who cares? You all evolved. You're nothing. But that's not the way it is in the creation model. In the creation model, the first prototypes were created by God in an environment that was made specifically for life. And humans were not just like anything else. They were made very specially. Let's read what it says. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. See, in the creation model, we are made special. We're made different. We're made in the image of God. And I'm going to share with you that what the other creatures are, is they're just basically being what they are. You could take uh, a PhD, some uh, big Ivy League university, and you could pay them six-figure salary, and they have, to take monkeys and to teach them to recognize symbols and to push buttons. But you take that same monkey and you put them back out into their natural environment and leave them alone, and they will never teach another. They would just go on being what they always were. But humans are different. You were made in the image of a creator, which means that you have the ability to go beyond simply being something to becoming something. Let me share with you uh, a story that helps illustrate that. Think about flight. How many of you out there have ever wanted to fly when you saw the birds flying in the sky? Ever said to yourself, you know, that would be more advantageous for me to get across town if I could fly. And I think that as, as early as history as we can imagine, man looked up at the birds and said, I want to fly. It's more advantageous. And so if, that's, if evolution is really true, then why don't I have an adaptation in my back, wings growing out of them so that I could fly across the neighborhood and I could get there better, right? It's more advantageous for me. Well, the real world is not like the imaginary illusion worlds created by science. In the real world, man uses his God-given abilities See, we're in, made in the image of God, which means we can choose, we can reason, and we can create. We can go beyond simply being something to becoming something. And God, when he wanted, man wanted to fly, God gave him his, all these abilities. And what did man do? He started putting his mind to work. The first of those uh, achievements happened when man overcame uh, gravity in balloons. 
But then something interesting happened. There was some scientists, one of them's name was Daniel Bernoulli, and he discovered an equation that uh, talked about fluid flow. And year, a few years later, there were some men who looked at the birds and saw how their wings were shaped, applied his Bernoulli's principle to the, to the wings with airflow, and discovered lift. And then two incredible engineers at the beginning of the 20th century put all of this together, and man took off into the skies in the first power flight. And we went from flying these to flying high-powered performance jets in less than 100 years. We, we, took, we looked up at the stars and the moon, and we used our minds to find a way to go to, to conquer the moon. We used our minds and created robots that took us to other worlds. And friends, it's no telling what we could do with our abilities that God has given us that no other creature can do. And so I want to ask you, friends, when you look at your life and you look at the real world around you, which model actually is the model that describes the data? I would like to share with you that it's the creation model. And I'd like to introduce you to your creator God. Because, friends, I believe that we are all in a world swimming with a deception. Now it's time for you to turn to your Creator God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we've looked at this hook that says only evolution fits the data, I pray that as we've seen the data and looked at these models, we realize that really we should be turning our eyes to you. We should be looking to our Creator, to our designer, who made it all in the first place. And I thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you again for coming to have you swallow the hook, a 21st century challenge to the 19th century worldview of evolution. In our next episode, number three, we'll look at this hook where they say there is no evidence of creation. And we'll find out why they say that and discover how you can actually see creation using scientific principles. So until then, goodbye. <laughs>